I am the mystery speaker. I'm trying to think of something really mysterious to do, but it's failed me, so I'll just be myself, okay? <laughs> Amen. I want to start off by reading a poem. I trust that you can get the atmosphere of it as I read it. Maybe we must put all the lights off. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> it's called The Awakening. Under the cold ground, silent struggle, life and death in combat, black frost, warm sun, silent scream, brown bulbs, seed shells pressing down tightly, holding in the life force, winter, barrenness. Stark lifeless branches silhouette against the sky, merciless cold nights, Dormant seeds, they lie. The months, they parade slowly by. The life within begins to call. Faint echoes of hope awaken. Small shoots and roots begin to tug. The grip of winter shaken. Pitter patter, first drops of rain are heard on this barren ground. Harder, harder begin to drum a symphony of sound. Still vast and brown and barren, as far as the eye can see, but underneath awakening, great creativity. Soil, softened by the gift of rain, allows the green within to burst forth in abundance, heralding the start of spring. The reason that I read that poem is that I wrote that poem <laughs> many moons ago. And I just wanted to set the atmosphere for what I want to speak about tonight. Because winter is really a strange time of the year. How many of us are winter people? <laughs> um, right. <laughs> yeah, we're in the minority here. <laughs> it's a strange time of the year when the air turns crisp and you cough and sneeze and do things like that. And... Um, I think one of the things that strikes me is when I fl fly to Johannesburg in the winter and you come in over the land and you look down and it's brown and gray and black and I don't know why the people in Gauteng do this, maybe somebody can tell me afterwards, but they burn fires everywhere, they burn their fields. So as you come in, you just see all the smoke and like all this dark and, and very, and a tremendously desolate feel. And that is what winter is like in Gauteng. We, of course, have got winter rain, which makes it a bit different here. But we've lived up there in Gauteng, and the leaves fall off the trees during winter, and you would never have guessed how many hundreds of millions of leaves can be on trees, because just when you've swept the yard, you will discover that the next morning it will need sweeping again. The leaves go, every last leaf, and sometimes you just see one or two last little ones in the breeze there, and then after a week or two, everything's gone. And those lifeless branches are just in the sky like that. That's how it works in winter. It's got a dead look, it's got a dead feeling, and it's freezing cold. I mean, we cold here, but man, they get cold in Gauteng. The other day it was minus eight in Vroenigung. I know none of you have never heard of Vroenigung, but it doesn't matter. <laughs> it was cold there. It's near Johannesburg. There's a lifeless feeling about winter. It's a completely different atmosphere to summer, where it's hot and sweaty and happy, and you can walk on the beach and stuff. If you're going to walk in winter, you really have to wrap up warmly and brace yourself against the elements. It's not user-friendly. Winter is not user-friendly. Of course, that's why they invented electric blankets and heaters and fires and all those kind of nice things. We all have winter seasons. We've all been through some of that stuff that I'm talking about, where the land lies bleak and you can't see a, a single green shoot on the tree. We've all had times like that in our lives. That's what I want to speak about tonight. The thing about winter is that you can't see anything happening. If you look at winter, there's nothing visible or visual for you to feast your eyes on at all. 12 years ago, which is a, a lifetime ago in some respects, I went through winter. And that winter that I went through, you know, you get different places have different winters. Like you get a Siberian winter, and then you get like a winter in Mauritius. So the winter that I went through 12 years ago 
was one of those Siberian ones where it gets about minus 40 or minus 50 or minus 60 and um, it becomes a struggle for survival. It becomes a struggle to stay alive and to actually do what you need to do. I'm sure all of us have been through a number of winters. I've also had some winters in Mauritius and winters in various other places of the world. Um, all in my own life, of course, and in, while, while living in Cape Town. Um, because everybody's life, nobody's life goes like this. God is like this. He's got a constancy, he's got a faithfulness, he's got an unchangeableness, and he's always like this. And he's always like this to us. But we, on the other hand, are like this. And that is what winter and summer, spring and autumn is like. There are seasons, and we go through different seasons of our lives. For some people, the winter, um, the summer is like that, and the winter is like that. For other people, it's like that. But in most people's lives, there are times that are deeply difficult where we face struggles that we wonder if we can actually come through. And that was a time like that for me. I used to say to my darling husband, I'm not going to make it. I'm not actually going to make this. What had happened is circumstances had become so difficult for us and they had become that we couldn't control them at all. Have you ever had that feeling where your life has spiraled out of control and you can't get it back? And ours was a circumstantial thing that was going on and it was so difficult. And he used to say to me, no, my darling, no, my lovey, my sweetheart, <laughs> it's going to be okay. Everything is going to be okay. And that's when I found the saying also that says everything is going to be okay in the end. If it's not okay, it's not the end. And I used to cling to that. It was four and a half years altogether of this particular Siberia. And three of those years, I never saw the sun. The sun didn't come out for me for three long years. And although I lived in the free world, I wasn't in a prison or somewhere where I couldn't physically see the sun, I could physically see the sun. But in my spirit, I couldn't find the sun. It was very difficult. After five months of, sa of no salary, it was very intense. It was extremely intense. And then also I watched my girls go through really, really difficult time. I watched them going through their own winter. As we went through the winter, they were drawn in because we, we were a family. And of course, when you are an adult, you've got coping mechanisms and you understand stuff. But when you are 10 years old, you find it very hard to process. When you're 14, you find it very hard to process some of the stuff was going on. And I watched their social infrastructure collapse around them. And I think it was one of the most difficult parts. It was like winter intensifying. It went like from 30 minus to 40 minus for us. But um, what is very interesting about, I think it was a, about a year or at least a couple of months before this uh, hard time started coming upon us, we were at a pastor's conference. And you know at pastor's conferences, I know you'd all love to be a fly on the wall at pastor's conferences. It's a, an amazing and excellent experience to be at. And it was actually a leader's conference. And the general overseer at the time and one of the guys stood um, in, in the last meeting, they stood there and they said to all the pastoral couples, come one by one and we're going to pray for you. And as each pastoral couple came, they blessed them, they prayed for them, and for every single one of those couples, a prophetic word came, where the Lord said to them various things that was pertinent to their situation, like a time of great breakthrough is coming upon you, or, you know, this is the direction you must go in, and, and it was amazing, and it was so fantastic. So now, we were quite at the back of the queue, but I had a great anticipation in my heart because I've received the prophetic word before, and I know that sense of God being so close and the, the intensity of those words as they come to you. So as we got there to be prophesied over, he put his hands on us and he said to us, I see a huge hand coming out of the sky and smacking you flat. Okay, all right, you know, now shambarabandi, you know. Okay, and he said, but but I see many different people are going to be rallying around you. People are coming around you. I think it's even said like unexpected people or not your usual people are gathering around you. And I see a restoration to twice of what you were before. Something amazing is going to be coming out of that. 
but the most, the, the kind of the biggest impact of that prophetic word was this big hand up the sky that was going to be coming to visit us. So he looked at us and he said, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm so sorry. I've never, ever had a prophetic word like that in my life before. So we looked at each other and said, well, we've never received a prophetic word like that before either, you know. And so in the car on the way back, the girls were traveling with their grandparents. We were now talking, what can this be? What can be such a big thing that will come into our lives and actually smack us flat? You know, here we are, and I mean, we were, we were doing well. We were going strong. The church was flying, flourishing, and we were blessed. And then when we started coming into that winter season where the circumstances changed so drastically, that prophetic word came back to us. And that prophetic word sustained me on, on many a dark day when the Lord said that people will surround you and you will get restored. Because you know what happened? That big hand came out the sky and it flattened us. And then people came around us, the most astonishing people. We met people outside of our circles that we'd never been in before. And what an amazing blessing they were to us. And we came to a place of restoration. And so now we're living in the twice as much, which is very exciting. The restoration part of it is on our lives. But I knew about praising God in every situation. I knew that. I learned that quite early on. I think it was Merlin Carruthers had brought out a book, Prison to Praise, I think it was called. Is that right? And everybody who was in the 70s read that book, Prison to Praise, about praising God in every circumstance. I knew about that. And I used to always praise God in every circumstance, except that I'd never visited Siberia before. So it became a challenge to praise God in every circumstance. I knew it in my head, but I used to ask myself, can I do it? Can I actually do this? Am I gonna be able to come through this? And then one day Luanne came to me with the words of a song, and it says, praise him. You notice I'm not reading the notes here, it's on this page here, because I know it's back to front, inside out, in my sleep, waking. Praise him in the morning, praise him in the evening. Praise him when you're young and when you're old, Praise him when you're laughing. Praise him when you're grieving. Praise him in every season of the soul. And that became my anthem. That became the thing that I sang, not once a day, not twice a day, on some days, more or less the whole day, I would be gritting my teeth. I would be saying, Lord, I will not look at the circumstances. I will trust you. Even though we were eating a great deal of bread and other commodities, it, at least we had bread. You know what I'm saying? But we didn't have what we were used to. Um, it was a bit like Job, I suppose. Job said, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. And that I also said many times. I said, Lord, if I die in this thing, at least I've died praising you. From my side, I will be faithful. I know that my trials, my tribulations, my difficulty, my change of circumstance, in no ways, is in any way at all, uh, got anything to do with who God is. God is God, whether I'm going through the sun or through the rain. He is magnificent, he is holy, he is worthy of our praise. And that was the thing that I had in my spirit that was so sustaining to me. So as we went on on our journey, we started calling it the hell road. <laughs> that kind of described it more or less, you know, the hell road. Went through all kinds of circumstances where the Lord began to challenge us to give up our identity in the ministry, to give up our pastorship, to give up the church, to give up our salary, to give up all kinds of things. That challenge came and it began to cut at the, at the base of our lives, like at the root of our lives, it was chopping away there. And man, I don't know if you've ever had that chopping, but it's not like um, an easy thing. It was a difficult thing. So the thing about the hell road, if God had have said to me, now my daughter Leslie, in his best King James, he would have spoken to me and said that, for four and a half years, you are going to walk a hell road. For three of those, the sun will not come out. So make yourself ready, prepare yourself to do this. I would have wanted to give up if I knew that it was going to stretch. I thought it was going to be a month or two or three or four, maybe five, okay. But after that, it would, it would come right. Of course it would come right. 
And it didn't come right, it didn't. And then it rolled into the years. And that's why I'm in my poem, I said, the years they parade slowly by. <laughs> they were just running their course and we were just praising, holding on, gritting our teeth and trusting God. God, what on earth are you doing with us? You know, when you read Bible stories and you've got Moses at the Red Sea and he's got the Egyptians behind him and you read the story and you think to yourself, well, this is absolutely amazing. Of course, there was no other way out of his predicament. He couldn't go up. He couldn't go down. He couldn't go back. Of course, God was going to open the sea in front of him. It's a logical thing. We know that. You know, it must have been so different to be that person standing at that sea <laughs> saying, oh, Lord. You know, with the entrance into the promised land, I always used to say, Lord, I will be like Caleb and Joshua. I would be the ones that would, that would trust you and that would love you, Lord. I would be the ones that would go in and take the promised land. I wouldn't be of the 10 that never believed you. And no, not me, Lord. But when I went through this, I thought, you know what? I wonder who I would have been when I went into the promised land. Would I have been one of those people who murmured? Or wouldn't I? I didn't know, but God was busy peeling off the layers of this onion. So things always look so easy when you look back. Yeah, God opened the Red Sea, of course. Now I look back, it's 12 years ago. I'm smiling, you know. I can say now, I'm glad I went through that. Now, if you had have asked me then, are you glad you're going through this? I would have said, never, no. Rescue me, help me, take me away. Any solution, anything, anything would have been better than those particular circumstances that were so difficult. But when I look back now, four and a half years and three years with the sun not coming out was the right amount of time for what God needed to do in my life and in my heart. In 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 7, he says, we walk by faith and not by sight. Faith is a spirit faculty. Faith isn't a natural faculty. He says we walk by faith, we connect it with God, but we don't walk by sight. What is walking by sight? It's walking in our emotions, basically. It's walking by our senses, what we see, what we taste, what we touch, what we feel, all that. He says that's not how we walk when we're born again. We don't walk by all this stuff. If you are going to walk every day of your life, but what you experience every day of your life, you will have a miserable life, I can tell you now. We have got to be anchored outside of what is happening every day in our life. We've got to be anchored within the veil. He, he says that's where our hope is. It's anchored, it's anchored within the veil. And then we live out our lives and we have that stability, that constancy, those attributes of God that we need to carry us through difficult times. You know what, God knows what he's doing with us. And at some level, I did know, I did know that. But at some other level, I often wondered, <laughs> Lord, are you sure you haven't perhaps like forgotten us completely? <laughs> and then it would come back to me again, you know. I am with you, I'm with you till the end of the world. Okay, well that will take me <laughs> quite away. I know that if there was an easier way for God to work what he needed to work in my life, in Arthur's life and in my girls, if there was another way or an easier way, I know that my loving heavenly father would have done it. I used to say to him, Lord, I'll take out a second bond and then I'll have a lot of money and then I'll go and buy the solution. Then I don't have to go through it. Can't I buy it, Lord? Lord, can't I earn it? Can't I run around the block a few times? I, I can do that. Lord, isn't there some other way? Lord, isn't there any other way than what I've got to go through? And the answer would come back, I will sustain you. I will keep you, but you've got to walk that way. But you know what? Also, at the same time about that prophecy with the hand, I'd been going through a patch where I'd been saying, Lord, I surrender all to you. I surrender all. And on more than one occasion, I'd gone down and I, I'd say, Lord, Everything that I am, everything that I have, I surrender to you. I give it to you. And you know what? God heard me. God heard me. And he said, okay, if you want to surrender everything, I will take you to heights that you've never dreamed of. But it's going to cost you something to get there. 
And I remember actually once actually lying on my stomach, and it was in a friend's lounge place, saying, Lord, I take it back. I take it back. Any surrender I've given to you, I, I retract it. I take it back. But you know, it doesn't work like that. Because although I actually did that, I actually did cry and kind of be a bit hysterical, I knew that if I could press through this, that God would do that thing in me that is so necessary. You know what, I had to die. Not that I am completely dead because life is a journey and life is a challenge and many things challenge us to die to ourselves every day if we're gonna be willing to. But there came a time where I had to die I suppose to big stuff. Some foundation had to be laid in my life because God's preparing me for something. I don't know where he wants to take me, but you know what? You know what this whole time told me? More than anything in the whole world, I want what he's got for me. More than anything in the whole world, I want to be what he's created me to be. I don't want to stand up there one day and he looks at me and I'm a half a person. And he says, well, you never got out of your com comfort zone. You never went and spoke to so-and-so that I prompted you. You never allowed the life of God to flow through you, so you're half a person. I want to be everything that he's put inside me that is able to rise up in me to become something incredible in the kingdom of God, not because of me. It was kind of in spite of me. Because that is what I see, the word of God is full of these men and women who took the challenge, who paid the price, and some of them with their, with their lives. I'm standing here today, I didn't die. But there are people who have died. There are people who've gone through this process, and when they got to a certain stage in their journey, they actually surrendered their life willingly as martyrs in the whole process to God. I count myself blessed and fortunate to be alive on the other side of this process and to be able to finish whatever God has got for me. And so it is with each one of you. And this thing that I'm talking about, that desire to rise up into everything that God has for you, I see it in people. All my 10 ladies on the back board there, I see it in them. But not only in them, in many others of you, I see that desire that says, God, whatever it takes, whatever the cost, Lord, I am so hungry for you that I will do it. Lord, just give me the strength when it comes to be able to press completely through. Okay. You see, when you go through the winter, you come out different on the other side. And that's what we've got to remember. You never come out the same on the other side of winter. Maybe some of you do or spring, or even autumn. But when you've been through a real winter, you are never the same again. It can either make you, or it can break you. I'll tell us some steps now of things, tools that God has given us to help us to come through this. And if we use that, we can come through victorious rejoicing at a totally another level. So you know what I want to say to you tonight, guys? Don't die in the winter. Don't die in the winter. You know, I don't know if you've read these novels I have in times past where people get trapped in snow and they get so cold, they get hypothermia and stuff and then they say all they want to do is they just want to drift off. They just want to, to float away and then all the cold and all the pain and all the frostbite and everything will be gone. You read that about mountain climbers, people who've climbed the Himalayas and stuff like that. They want to just die in the winter because you know why it's easier to die in the winter because you can just be rid of it all and there are people who have died in the winter while the branches of the trees are bare in the outside the life of the spirit of God the sap inside the tree is busy flowing and preparing it for spring although you see nothing on the outside in winter it is the busiest time it's the busiest season on the inside did you know that that is the time when the new life, the strength for the new life that he's gonna push forth in spring is busy being prepared and it takes a whole winter season to bring the tree to that place before it starts to break through. Have you ever seen gum on a tree? I know in millions, millions of years ago <laughs> when I used to climb trees, I remember seeing pods of gum on the tree and it always fascinated me because sometimes it would trap an ant or something like that. You see a little ant there. But you know, if that resin 
that um, life force of the tree comes out. It's when the tree is wounded. It's when there's a break in the bark, it gets forced out. And it's like the lifeblood. And it becomes an incredibly precious thing over time because it becomes amber. That is actually where amber comes from. And um, I've got um, more than one friend that have got amber jewelry that is very, very precious and very valuable. And they set it in rings, in pendants, in all kinds of things because it's such a very, very precious substance. And that is what happens to us at the place in our trees where our wounding takes place. That is where the resin comes forth that becomes the amber if we get healed. It becomes the most precious place in our lives. Isn't that amazing? Um, in the early 1900s somewhere, I don't know exactly who it was, somebody got an inspiration to make an amber room. And it was within the Russian dynasty and stuff like that. It was quite a big room, four, four walls, and it was called the amber room. No surprise there, because it was four tons of amber that they took and crafted with gold into a room, the most incredible room you've ever seen. Do you know that you even get blue amber? Not all trees bleed the same. Some bleed um, a light orangey amber, some bleed a very deep dark, and some bleed a blue. It's all different types of amber and, uh, and different preciousness to do with the amber. And anyway, when the Second World War came, that room got dismantled and has never been found again. I just thought that was interesting, by the way. <laughs> but you know, I like to think of our lives as a room of amber. That is what my life is. It's crafted pieces hanging. I mean, if you see pictures of that, it's, it's something absolutely incredible. It's a bit like mosaic, all these pieces of amber that put into pictures and, and stuff like that. In John 3 and verse 2, God says to us, he wants us to prosper. Sometimes we go through the winter in order that we can prosper because we weren't prospering before the winter. He says he wants us to prosper and be in health as our souls prosper. It is possible that our bodies don't prosper because our minds are not prospering because our thoughts are toxic. Now God is the source of all of our emotions and our capacity to feel emotion comes from him. He himself, God himself, the word is full of it, has experienced, or is actually, love, joy, peace, all kinds, of experience, all kinds of emotions that God has experienced. Even anger, God is angry without sinning, and it even says that God is jealous. You know that he's jealous over us, he guards us, he wants us so intensely. So if all of our emotions come from him, then it stands to reason that all of our emotions need to be poured back to him. 1 Peter 5 and verse 7, one of my favorite verses, it says, casting all your care upon him for he cares for you. Now imagine the Bible just said, casting all your care upon him. We'd say, oh, thank you, Lord, that's so awesome. That's something I can do. I can cast all my care upon him. But he says, because he cares for you. And that is so like the cherry on the thing for me. That is so beautiful. So there comes a time in our lives where we need to take our emotions and we need to pour it back into God so that God can deal with us. We walk around toxic. We walk around heavy laden. We walk around with stuff that has happened from day to day that we haven't processed or dealt with. We should be pouring it back to God. But our vessels become polluted and toxic and then we think to ourselves, let's go for counseling. That can sort it out. Where, in fact, we should be transacting with God every day the things that have happened in our lives. You know, if somebody doesn't greet you at church, that is a hurtful thing. And it has happened to me many times, and it probably will still, and I'm sure it wasn't on purpose, and even if it was, let's get a life. But nevertheless, it can trigger rejection in a person's life. Somebody doesn't greet, you think, oh, you know, whatever, and it brings up old stuff. We need to go to the Lord, we need to say, Lord, it was so and so, but it's never in Kingsgate, ever, you know. Um, it's only in other places. Um, they didn't greet me, and Lord, it hurts. So at this place that I'm hurting, I pour it out to you, I pour it back to you, and I receive your healing from my heart. And if we transact day to day, we will not become toxic, because our vessels will stay clean, they will stay filled, we will stay with our spirits on top and ruling, and we'll stay healthy and well, and not toxic at all. 
What is so interesting, I, I was chatting to somebody the other day, somebody who doesn't know the Lord at all, and they said to me, they, they are looking for, no, no, they're not looking for a job, they need a job. They need a job, but it's fine, the universe will present. <laughs> so I thought, that is the most random, ob, strange, different thing that I've ever heard, the universe will present. Who's the universe? As far as I know, the universe is like a huge glob of matter out there somewhere. The universe what? You know, the universe, universe. We have a father who cares for us, who says, come, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, I will give you rest, come, come to me. That's what he says, he's a father, a dad. So if we do that every single day, we will be able to come into a good spiritual, mental, emotional health place. I knew a lady, must be about 30, 30, 35 years ago, and this particular couple couldn't have children. And they went through all the agonies. I've never been in that position, but I've walked with some people in that position, and it's a hangover thing to go through. They were unable to have children, and so they put their names on an, an adoption list, and they received a little baby boy after some time. And as you know, even when you've had your own baby, you have a natural longing for this child, and the need to nurture, to love, and all those things that are built into us as mothers, and she did that so well. But something went very, very wrong, because the mother of that baby decided that she wanted the child back. And I don't know the legalities, but it so happened that they actually came and they took this little boy away from her. And she had waited and longed, and it had been years of first trying for their own baby and then the adoption and everything that goes with it. So she was shattered, as you can imagine. It's a hang of a thing to go through. And shortly afterwards, she began to get arthritis in her hands. And her hands began to be misshapen and they eventually were so misshapen that she couldn't pick up a cup. She could only like pick like that. She couldn't, she had no dexterity movement at all in her fingers. It spread to her whole body. She eventually, it's a long story because it was over a couple of years, she eventually landed in a wheelchair. Her toes were like that. Her legs, her whole body became crippled, literally physically crippled with arthritis. And in the end, when she died, she died well, having been, been in a wheelchair for years. She died in the winter. She got disappointment and she got discouragement, like all of us have. Every single one of you people here have had some crushing things that have happened in your life. Sometimes a small thing, medium things, life happens. But it is so important to recover from disappointment and discouragement. It is so important to be able to pick yourself up and dust yourself off and move again. If you are a skier skiing down a slope and you fall and it's snowing, if it's snowing when you first fall and you get up, it's fine, you shake the snow off and on you go. But the longer you lie there, the, the more snow that comes, eventually that snow will be com compacted and you will die in the winter, literally die in the winter like she did. And if I think, I mean, all of us know people, cases, things that have happened in life. But when I think back, I think that must have been one of the most sad scenarios that she couldn't forgive because she could not forgive that mom that came to get her baby back. If she had have been able to do that, she could have recovered. She could have got better. She, the arthritis wouldn't have set in. Because what happens, we begin to be toxic in our heads. We begin to have resentment and anger and bitterness and hatred and sometimes even murder. There's a whole process that goes on in our head. And when our thoughts are really toxic, it starts pressing and pushing through all kinds of hormones and chemicals into our bodies that make us sick. And that's what we do in healing rooms. We say to people, forgive, forgive, let it go so that you can move on. Because as, as long as a person is visiting that place of unforgiveness, as long as the pain is sitting there, you can become sick and even disabled and even die in the winter if you don't recover. So if ever there was an important thing to do, 
it's to allow the Holy Spirit to minister into those places, and I'm talking about the deep places of disappointment and hurt and so on. And not just a general forgiveness. Well, Lord, I just, you know, I forgive the world and his wife and, and it's all happy and sunshine. We don't forgive a person for who they are, remember. We forgive them for what they've done. So we need to visit the place and say, Lord, that person didn't greet me on that day and that's where my pain lies. Father God, my mother abandoned me. Well, I mean, my mother didn't, but I'm just using it as an example. Um, and that is the place. I forgive her for that. I release it and I let it go. It's very, very powerful. It brings such a release into our lives, such a healing into our hearts and into our minds. Um, I think also dis disappointment is a very deep thing because it lodges, I think, into the deepest part of our being and it's a hope destroyer. It's a destroyer of hope. When you've hoped for something, you've believed, you've trusted, you've kind of clung to it, you've hung onto it, and then for some reason it doesn't happen, it stops your ability to hope again if it keeps on carrying on for a long time. And we need to deal with it so that we don't become toxic. We have to learn to process it. So I want to say, don't, don't die in the winter. Don't die in the winter like that lady did. God has given us everything we need to live lives that are able to overcome the most severest, terrible obstacles that have ever come our way. The worst thing that you ever think could ever happen to you, whatever that might be, God is able to help you to come through that thing. That's how he works. He's poured out grace. He's poured out mercy. Jesus came to heal the brokenhearted. He came to open the prison door. He came to set the captive free. What I've got to do is receive it for my life so that I can be fine and serve him and walk well. God has given us repentance. You know, we don't often hear repentance preached. Well, we do here because we're a G12 church and we talk a lot about repentance. But generally in the church, out there at large, you don't often hear a message of repentance. Repentance is the most powerful thing. It's one of the most powerful forces in the whole world. Because where the enemy has got legal right in our lives through things that have happened, when we start repenting, it breaks down that foundation and it causes him to have to go. He cannot stay to torment you once you have repented. It's the same principle for forgiveness. Once we have chosen to forgive and to let it go, that platform, that legal right of the enemy, where he sits, where he torments, where he goes after you, yapping on your heels day after day, has got to go in the name of Jesus. And another thing that, that is really powerful that God has given us is um, when we have acts of obedience that take our focus off ourselves, acts of obedience full stop, but I think God often gives it to us so that we can take our focus off ourselves. I don't live for myself. I'm called to live for you. You don't live for yourself. You're called to live for me and for everybody else. That's how it works. So he's given us these powerful things. And when we do this, now you know it's um, week 11 of blessing. So here comes the part about blessing. As soon as we start repenting, we start forgiving, we start having it as a lifestyle the blessing starts to flow. As soon as we become obedient, if you go and read Deuteronomy 28, it will tell you, obedience, obedience, blessing, blessing. Obedience, obedience, blessing, blessing. Blessing isn't random. We're not asking God to do something random here. There's gotta be obedience so that God can bless us. Because as we, as we do this, we bring ourselves into alignment. If you've got an open tap and you want to put something under this open tap, it's coming into alignment. We bring that thing under the tap so that we can receive the blessing. If the tap is open and God's tap is always open and I'm standing here, I'm not aligned. If I'm walking in unforgiveness, unrepentance, whatever my circumstance is, holding stuff against other people, talking about other people, as soon as I do this, as soon as I align myself, the water is there. God is waiting for us to bless us. And as we've been doing this over the 11 weeks, there have been the most awesome testimonies. I don't know if all of you have been hearing about awesome testimonies and financial breakthrough, been hearing a lot about financial breakthrough. So yes, Lord, yes, we are aligning ourselves. If we look at the word discouraged in the word of God, there are four different ways that it's translated. The one is, it says, 
It melts, discouragement melts our hearts. How sad is that? That's what happens when you've become discouraged. It's like your heart has been melted in you. Another one, break our heart. When you become discouraged, that's how it's translated. It, it broke our hearts. Or to lose heart. Now, if I was standing up here right now and I had to lose my heart through some <laughs> amazing thing that happened, I wouldn't be alive very long. When it says there, they lost heart, it's your spirit man. Your spirit man can lose his heart. And that's what happens to a lot of people. They, their hearts are beating on the outside, but their hearts aren't beating on the inside. Their spirit man, spirit man has lost heart. And if ever there's one thing that we don't want to do, we don't want to lose heart. And the fourth one is to become shortened. That's how it's translated. Discouraged means to become shortened. Now you know that scripture that says that we've got to enter into the stature of the fullness of Christ. When you're discouraged, you can't do that. You're only half as tall as you should have been when you're discouraged. So the thing is to deal with it, deal with it one way or the other. So in conclusion, I want to look at what it is to be encouraged because the gospel of Jesus Christ is the good news. So to be encouraged means to strengthen. So every time you encourage yourself, you're strengthening, strengthening on the inside. It means to become strong or it even means to harden and toughen up. And that's for all of us, not just for the guys from this morning. Us girls also need to harden and toughen up. In 1 Samuel 30 and verse 6, it says there that David was greatly distressed. Well, I would also be greatly distressed if a nation was trying to stone me. <laughs> that was the situation he was in. The people had turned against him and wanted to stone him. So what did he do? What did David do? I, I just love David. It says here, he strengthened himself in the Lord his God. He didn't become toxic. He went straight to the Lord and he strengthened himself. He didn't go for counseling, he strengthened himself. I don't have a problem with anyone coming for counseling, by the way. I'm just saying our minds need to just get it. There is a place for counseling, definitely, but it's after we've processed all the toxic and maybe we can't help ourselves further. So his first port of call, when he had these overwhelming emotions, when he was greatly distressed, he went and he cast it on the Lord, casting all your care upon him because he cares for you. Psalm 27 and verse 13 and 14, which became a very favorite verse of mine in Siberia, it says, I would have lost heart. Well, I tried quite hard at times. <laughs> I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. I'm so glad he says in the land of the living because maybe it would have said I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord one day in heaven. But he doesn't say that. He says in the land of the living. He says while you're still here, while you're still alive, you're actually going to come through this. Now, I might be the first person to break this to you in your whole life. But you know, winter can't last forever. It can't last forever in the natural and it can't last forever in the spiritual. There comes a time when the breakthrough comes and the most wonderful thing about the end of winter is spring. And you don't see it so much in the Cape because we're all green anyway. But I've got such a beautiful picture of a bulb that is pressed through the ice. You see all the ice glistening here and there this bulb is actually sitting in full flower in the ice. There comes spring. There comes time when that life sap of the tree has gathered all the strength that it can, when enough warmth and enough light and whatever it needs comes and it starts pressing through. Have you ever seen a tree with the tiniest covered in the tiniest green buds? And what happens after that first green? The flower comes. And you see some flowers like some of these plum trees and almond trees that are covered and that are so fragrant. That's what happens after winter. And then after that, what happens? The fruit comes, lots of fruit. For every little flower, a piece of fruit hanging there on the tree. Absolutely amazing. Psalm 73 and verse 26 says, my, my flesh and my heart may fail, 
but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I want, to say, I want you to say to somebody next to you, God is the strength of my heart. Say it again. God is the strength of my heart. You see, his promise is to keep us. His promise is to strengthen us. His promise is to carry us through. And then his promise is to restore us at the end of all of it. Now what I would like to do, I've chosen Ephesians 3 verse 14 to 21 because I believe in the impartation of blessing. And the Lord has been speaking to me about the activation of blessing. And I'm not even sure all the ramifications of the activation of blessing, but I've been going like this a lot because I think, okay, Lord, it's like prophetic, activating the blessing here tonight. So I've chosen this scripture and I'd like to pray it over whoever would like to receive this blessing tonight. If you would like to, please stand. Father, tonight we receive this scripture of yours as a blessing and as a benediction. We receive this from you because your word says to us that your word is alive and powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, joint and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of our hearts. We know that your word goes in to the deepest places of our beings. And I pray that for each one of us tonight that we will be able to receive and to hold on to this word of encouragement that comes from you, Lord. So it's Ephesians chapter 3, and I'm reading from verse 14 to verse 21. For this reason, I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named, that he would grant you, and that's you, Kingsgate, and any visitors among us, that he would grant you, according to the riches of his glory, to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man, that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, that you, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. And now unto him, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that works in us, to him be glory in the church by Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. And God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.